She's a small town girl turned Emmy winning TV producer with her sights set on changing the narrative. Corey King shares her incredible journey from rural Delaware to Hollywood heavy hitter behind hit shows like Yanla Fix My Life and Queer Eye. Learn how this spiritual creative overcame culture shock and self doubt to find her calling of telling relatable stories that heal. Now a proud mother of almost five, Corey gets real about balancing ambition with parenting, maintaining her relationship, and the motivation behind her next passion project. Get insight on the importance of vulnerability, service, and ambition from this multi-talented dynamo. See yourself in her story and uncover the inspiration to do it anyway on this week's How Does She Do It? All right. Welcome, Corey King, to the How Does She Do It podcast. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Very exciting. Likewise. So I'm just going to give you a chance to introduce yourself. For people that don't know who you are, tell us who are you and a bit about what you do. I am Corey King. I am, first of all, a mom, a partner, and a producer. Um, I have been producing for the past 14 years, which sounds crazy because I don't feel like I'm old enough to have done anything for 14 years. <laughs> um, so yeah, I grew up in Delaware, small town girl, um, came to the big city, Atlanta, went to Clark Atlanta University for college and um, never really looked back. I went to school thinking that I was going to be a teacher and they had this mass media arts department and there was like Oprah Winfrey and like Michelle Obama and like all these like Spike Lee and like all these extraordinary people. I'm like, wait a minute. I need to be in that building. What is going on over there? And so I did. I went to that building. I switched. I thought I was just like, you know, in Atlanta having fun. Um, I grew up in, like I said, small town Delaware. So the idea of doing anything, you know, extreme or hmm. like being in a TV or anything like that is just not something that you would connect with because, you know, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> um, so teaching and nursing and my father's a bishop. So like teaching, nursing, Christianity, that's it. Like super conservative, su super small town, super small mind I had at the moment. I went to Clarkson University. Um, I've transferred to mass media arts. Mm -hmm. And literally my life changed. Um, my life changed mainly because of what I was exposed to. And I think that's like, you know, obviously for all of us, that's the biggest thing is like exposure. And once you're exposed to it, you know, you get to find out the things that you do and do not like and do not love. And um, it's so interesting, though, because even though I grew up in Delaware and super small town, I always dreamt big, like in my mind, you know, Something as simple as I was like, I grew up in the era where everybody had either Bow Wow or Romeo on their walls, right? <laughs> I had like the posters and I used to like look up at the picture like, I'm going to meet Bow Wow one day and I'm not even going to think about it anymore. Girl. It's just going to happen. I, wait, I just tell you, I mine was Usher. Mine, okay. Usher yes. was on the wall. Yes. And, I, and I did meet him. Another story for another. Okay. Proceed, please. Yes, yes. Aging, a subtle aging. What was the um? What was the magazine that we used to like rip the posters out of? Okay, I wasn't that crazy. I would print them on my computer and tape them together to make. No, oh, it was a magazine. I can't. Tiger beat, huh? Tiger beat. No. Uh, 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 I'll think of it. Okay, I'll think of it. Anyway. Posters everywhere, hang up later. I'm going to meet Bella one day, you know, and I'm going to live in a big old house. And I'm like, I've always dreamt big, um, you know, like at the, I grew up, I was always the only black kid in my class. Um, but even then, you know, I had the highest SAT scores in my school, you know, like I was always an overachiever in that way. Um, I was raised by my grandparents a lot. And my grandfather, like, really instilled in me, like, if you believe it, you can achieve it. Like, that, I remember hearing that from, like, the very beginning. So I used to be like, I want to be a doctor who does the hair, who is a lawyer. <laughs> I would do all these things. And so always, always, like, had an overachieving mind. And always, you know, he always also taught me that, like, you're a one percenter. You know, like, you are a one percenter. If 99% is bad, that's okay, because you're a one percenter. You'll always be the good. You'll always be the better. Um, and so instilling that in me, just like really 
you know, manifested itself in my life now. Um, and so I went to Clark Atlanta. Go ahead. You had to ask me something. I'm curious. Number one, your grandfather, was he black? Yes. Okay. So you're in Delaware. Huh? It just sounds homogeneous. <laughs> it sounds white. That's what it sounds like. Very. So you're in white Delaware with black grandparents, black girl. First of all, how? Why uh, Why are you in Delaware? My whole family. Uh, okay, so another interesting fact. So I grew up in this place, not just Delaware. It's called Slaughter Neck, Delaware, okay? The name Slaughter Neck came from during the Civil War, um, there was it was a battlefield and there was so much bloodshed that when it would rain, you could smell. Stop. Not kidding. Um, and so they killed like all these black people, but like the families ended up sticking around and accumulating like land and all these things. Um, and so my grandfather was I'm sorry, my grandmother's grandfather was the first black man to own like it was a few of them wow. that owned this land in Delaware with Slaughter Neck. Um, still own the land today. Like it's like been passed down. Um, so they came there from Elizabeth City, um, Virginia. Uh, and they had been there since then. And so there are these pockets of communities, just kind of okay. like anywhere, but there's these pockets of communities of blacks in Delaware whose families have been there for like hundreds and hundreds of years who have like this property and the, the this land. And it's like the only thing they own yeah. um, that they've had for like years. So Okay, fascinating. So even though you're in very white Delaware, you've got deep roots and in your history and your family history, so you grow up around a lot of white people. And it, it, from the way you described it, it sounds like you also grew up without much exposure to mass media or people that went out into the world and did high performing things. For me, black people were poor. Black people were bottom. Black people were poor. I did not experience like coming to Atlanta was a culture shock for me, an absolute yep. culture shock. Yeah. Um, to see black people yep. driving nice cars or living in <laughs> big houses or um, just being successful. Everywhere. And, seeing black and, people and, 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 and every seeing them role. everywhere. Right. Seeing them everywhere. It was whenever I saw black people everywhere growing up, it was in a poor neighborhood. They were never affluent in any way. Yeah. Um, so that exposure also ignited something that my grandfather had been trying to instill mm. in me, but mm. I had never saw, right? Like and when I went to school, I was the only black kid in the class. All the other classes with the black kids w weren't as affluent, right? Obviously mm. they were not so uh, performative classes. Um, and so going to school, I was always in like these programs. I always had to do something extra or go to something outside of my norm to experience black being even mediocre. Right. Interesting. Um, and so that yeah. was a big culture shock for me when I got to <clears throat> Atlanta and experienced black being, you know, phenomenal. The, and, and the norm. And that that's, being normal. That's the other thing. Yeah. It becomes the norm. Yeah, um, I completely so understand so that it made me I, I didn't really understand, Kara. I didn't really understand because, you know, like you're young, you're you're experiencing life. Um, And my grandparents and I had gotten accepted to a college in Delaware, which is obviously predominantly white and it was affluent and I wanted to go. Um, I did all my paperwork myself and like forged signatures because my family wanted me out of there. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> my grandmother was like, no, you're going to Spelman at the time. You're going to Spelman. I'm like, I'm definitely not going to Spelman once I got there and there were no guys. It's like, definitely not doing that. But I'll go across the street. And so <laughs> anyway, um, I got into Clark Atlanta writing, got me scholarships into Clark Atlanta. Um, and when I went back home was when I realized that my normal was different. Um, because I went to the grocery store, I didn't see people like me. I went to the boardwalk, I didn't see people who looked like me. I saw seas and seas of people who did not look like me. And I didn't under I didn't recognize like the framing that it had created in my life until <laughs> I went back home. Um, after being in Atlanta for so long, because I'm not, I'm not just in Atlanta, I'm in the AUC, right? And so yeah. everything that I'm learning is about like 
not just Martin Luther King, but who are the people that were with him and who are the people that supported him and pushed him? And like some of those people are my professors, you know, W.E. Du Bois is Clark Atlanta. Um, and so learning and, and becoming so rich in this kind of history, um, I had like shedded this part of me that came from Delaware, but not knowing because that part of me that I was shedding was absolute self-hate, right? Mm. And, and self um, doubt and, and, uh, and, uh, looking down on my people. Like when I grew up, you did not, it was told you don't go somewhere where there's a lot of black people because that's going to be dangerous. Yeah. And no. I, didn't, and the, and the new framing didn't come until I experienced it from Clark Atlanta. So I, I absolutely owe that completely, um, to them. But my, pe- my grandparents, they tried to instill that into me the whole time, but it was words, right? It's yeah. Different when you have the actual experience. And so it was connected mm. to me in a way it was like, oh, you know, to see that experience. And so when I went back home and there were nobody who looked like me and all the people that drove by in the cars didn't look like me. And the only things that did, or the only people who did look like me, they didn't have what I had. They didn't have the confidence even because yeah. they taught all the time that we were below. Um, so it's like you grew, you grew up being set aside because you were black. You go out into the world, you go into blackity blackness. You come to Atlanta, Wakanda, Clark, Atlanta, (laughs) Uh, and then you go back home and you realize you're set aside again, but in a different way because of your exposure. Absolutely. Um, And I feel like. Do you see a, a narrative or a theme even now? as you're standing where you are today in your career and what you've recently accomplished, which we absolutely need to talk about. (laughs) Do you see how that theme has continued or any through lines of being set aside, being set apart in your environments? Yeah, it was a setup, right? It was a setup and not in a bad way. It was a setup because um, unfortunately Delaware is not unique in its, um, no, it, it's, it's and, I, and I'll tell you, like, it, everything that you're saying, I resonate with so much personally because I'm from a small town in Kansas, a farm town. And when I first left Kansas, I also came to Atlanta. Oh, wow. Okay. Share the exact culture shock experience of, wow, Black people do everything. I mm-hmm. went to Georgia State University to finish my degree. Mm-hmm. And at Kansas State, I was studying American ethnic studies, which was broad. Mm-hmm. Georgia State had African-American studies or nothing. So I ended up getting a minor in African-American studies. And even the education around cultural studies was different. It was, quite frankly, militant. Mm -hmm. Um, And for me, that actually, I tend to swing between extremes. I'm in this very white place. So I'm like, getting my hair braided so I can look like Alicia Keys, like doing everything I can. I'm I'm even trying to like, girl, I'm even trying to talk like this, you know? I'm yeah, trying yeah, so hard. Yeah, yeah. Then I come to Atlanta and I'm like, oh, I love John Mayer. He's actually my favorite artist. Oh, I really like, I don't mind being white or perceived yeah. as not a black girl. So I'm saying that to say these extremes of your environment, and coming from a small town, going to a big city, I think a lot of times people misunderstood how those extremes allow you to choose where your middle ground is. Yeah, but you know what else, though, Kara? It definitely influenced confusion. Um, and it influences the <laughs> idea of how I mean, it, it creates a struggle of figuring out who you genuinely are. Yeah. Um, because in Delaware, I'm not black enough. Right. Because of the way that I speak, I was always. Yep. I was yep. Gonna, in Atlanta, <laughs> it's like, can you relate to the well, especially with in my career? Because, you know, in my career, it's all about relatability. And it's like when I'm doing like housewives, it's like, can you relate to these women? Um, because you do speak that way, because you are an incredible writer, and because you do let's have to educate. Okay, like, let's talk about a little bit about what you do and how that has influenced. So you mentioned Housewives, but tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on and how it's influenced it. Oh my God. Um, so I'm a I'm an executive producer. Um, I started off in the industry as an actual PA, like from the bottom, had no idea what I was doing. Um, 
but I became really good really fast. <laughs> um, so I have produced shows from Preacher's Wives to Love and Hip Hop early on in my career. Um, Atlanta Housewives to Iyama Fix My Life, which is like, you know, my grow up show. You know, that's the show that I kind of grew up on. I did that show for very many years. Um, and then I moved on to more premium content and most recently like Queer Eye. Um, so I've done all kinds of shows, uh, but that's what I do. I, I produce shows and my niche or specialty in those are finding really, really deep authentic stories and being able to sure. help coach people through exploring those stories in the most compelling way. I love this <laughs> because it's really those storylines that make all of those shows worth watching. I'm a huge fan of the show Queer Eye because of the narrative and, and really a lot of what Karamo's character brings to those stories is what grounds it into uh, relatability. It's what makes us see ourselves in the people yeah. that it's going through. And this is what you do. Absolutely. So when you think of like a Karamo or like a Iyala, if you're familiar with the Yellow Fix My Life on OWN, um, so those are my niches, right? Like the, my niche is, are those pillars specifically. And, you know, I did get a lot of coaching from Yella. She taught me so much. I'm so indebted to her in terms of like my ability and my skill and my um, ability to identify, you know, these uh, voids and holes. And, and so where it all really comes and what she helped me understand were patterns, right? Like everything is energy and energy is mm. um, manifested in patterns, right? Mm. And so, even though we're all different and we come, you come from Kansas and I'm from Delaware and the next person is from wherever, what we experience is, is, is in a pattern and I, being able to identify the manifestations of those patterns help me to make a plan for somebody to quote unquote, see the light. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so being able to do that on a level where I am like producing these shows is what I bring to each thing project that I do specifically. So like if you use a show like um, The Impact, which is like a show on BET Plus, right? Um, that show notoriously is just like, you know, young millionaires who are like navigating their lives and finding their ways. But if you watch an episode that is like specifically my level of skill and like what I offer, you would see like one of the characters who's Ari, she has this like storyline with her father and we go back and we meet her dad. And so like, it's through my conversations and understanding of him and her um, of how to navigate this in a way that this is a real issue. And not right. only is it a real issue, it's a real issue that I feel like I have a responsibility to continue to try and cure in my community, right? Mm. How do we explore that, okay? How do we explore that in a way that still feels compelling, right? This is just not the way my mind thinks of producing reality TV. I think of you whispering in someone's ear, so-and-so, you know, stole your man. Or I saw so and so. I, I imagine that that's how it goes. How did you even end up in this type of a niche? That's how I was taught. Don't get me wrong. I was taught that way. And a lot of the people that I like, I, you know, I explained some of the shows that I started off my career with. <laughs> and a lot of the people, they, I, I was under the understanding, I'm sorry, I was under the misunderstanding that that was the only way to produce a show. Like, that's what a good show looks like. And it wasn't, it was through my learning with the Yama, um, that you can create authentic content where you are still holding a level of integrity to your community. I'm a mother of two black girls, right? And so I cannot be a part of what is pushing them to fill their lips and their bodies with self-hate and disappointment and disgust. I cannot be a part of that. Right. Ooh. But, but at the same time, it's like, but you also can't just walk away because if you walk away, then who is going to create the content that makes her love herself? That makes representation. Her exactly. Influence, Influence in the media and authentic. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Authentic. Because a lot of these storylines are like, girl, you stole your man and black women can't get along. And we always want to fight and we always scratching and surviving. And we never, you know, it's always crabs in a barrel. All of that is a narrative that doesn't necessarily line up with who we actually are. Right. We become this because people have told us this. But when you think about your girlfriends or when you go to Thanksgiving dinner, when you hear stories about like the breakdowns in other cultural families, sometimes that's so foreign to us. We cannot even conceptualize yeah. because that's not who we are as a people. Genuinely. Right. right. It's interesting. A, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine who recently um, passed on his name is Nathan Lewis Jackson. And he uh, was a playwright. He wrote for television as well. Um, he's actually the first black playwright ever to have, a show at the Lincoln Center. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Brokeology. Um, and Nathan had this ability to tell a story where the characters were black from Kansas City, because that's where he's from. And okay. so he's always representing Kansas City, your love favorite city. Kansas, love Kansas City. Love Kansas City. So his characters were black because he's black. And and, and yet the stories were so universal. He lost his father to MS. Uh, and so in Brokeology, in this play, you know, the father has um, MS and the mother has passed on. And so he tells this narrative of this like family that is struggling with poverty, that's struggling to survive, that's struggling to get along, that's struggling with grief. Yeah. But he tells the story so well and so true to the grief and the pain that anyone who watches that, you're weeping. It doesn't matter yes. who yes. you are. And it sounds like you've got a similar way of producing people Absolutely. so that Absolutely. everyone can look at your characters and look at the, you know, the, the narrative. Because remember, humanity is a pattern. Humanity is the same. Although we, um, although we think we're on these different frequencies, we're still human. So we're not, right? Yeah. And so a story and its true authenticity is going to be the story of humanity, not of culture, because mm. there is a um, div- uh, is a is a mechanism of division. Right. Ah, so good. <laughs> so, so if good. we are if, if, so if we are talking about what it means to feel abandoned by your parent that does not live in a culture, it lives in humanity. And it doesn't mm. matter if you grew up in Africa or if, if you grew up in Asia it, or America, like that experience, that brokenness, that abandonment, that continuing to look for that in other things lives in the human, right? Uh, how so- did you, how, like, yes, right? Yes, I'm with you. I, I think a lot of people feel that, but we don't necessarily see that. What, and I know you said that it happened on the show with, um, I, f- I never say her name right. Iyanla. Iyanla. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Girl, Iyanla. Okay. Yeah. So I know this happened on the show with Iyanla, but what happened for you that allowed you to go from an industry where they're telling you to be inauthentic and create drama to from now on, I'm going to really tie my career to this idea of authenticity and focus on representing my culture well? Um, I think the first thing that happened is on this show, right? I was, um, seeing some of the most bizarre stories and some of the most, um, traumatic experiences. And even in those, I could see me or my sister or my uncle, or my friend, or my grandma, right? And these people did things that I couldn't fathom to think of to do, right? Um, whether it was like sexual abuse of their child or oof. their sibling. And, and like those feel like oof, right? Those feel like oof. But when you talk about what got me there, when you talk about what, I, what I process, when you talk about what was negligent, when you talk about the voids, those feels the same, right? I know what it feels like to wait 
for your father to show up and he never comes. I know what it feels like to watch your mom cry because she doesn't know how like ends are going to meet. I know what it feels like to see your aunt, you know, um, rescued from abuse of a partner. Like I know what those things feel like. I know what it feels like to be afraid. I know what it feels like to feel alone. I know what all of those things feel like. And although they didn't manifest themselves in, in those extremes, I realized that that's because of the exposure. But what if I didn't have my grandfather? And what if I didn't have, because guess what? My cousins don't have their grandfather. Mm. My cousins don't have that influence. And some of their things look like that. And so when I started to experience firsthand what was happening and I could use those methods to go back and say, hey, and try, not try it on my family, but try it on my family. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and say, hey, let's talk about it this way. And like, hey, let's have this kind of conversation. And like, what is this level of empathy and understanding relationships? I mean, it's just so much, girl, it's a whole other podcast, but just like understanding like, you know, who you are with as a reflection of who you are to yourself, right? Mm. Now, Under- let's, let's unpack that for a moment. Who you are with is a reflection of who you are to yourself. Absolutely, 100%. 100%. What does that mean to you? It means that if you have a partner who is abusive, you are abusive to yourself and you need to figure that out. Mm. If you have a partner who, and, and you know, we always teach people that like, find the thing that you hate the most in your partner and fix that in you. Mm. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. I feel like that is what Oprah would call a tweetable moment. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Find the thing you hate most in your partner and fix that in you. Because Oh of- my goodness. That is such a challenging question. As somebody who's married, I know you're partnered. Uh Okay, do you take your own advice? I have to. I yeah. have to. I have to a lot and it is a, it is a work, but you know what I found, you know, um we talk about, so yes, I'm a partner, um, love, love, love of my life. Absolutely. It's another day, the conversation with another, but that's my man. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> and I have to, because, um, it, it's too loud not to right? my mm. teaching and my experience is like something that I genuinely believe in and it's too loud for me not to. And so I have to, because I realized that iron sharpens iron. And so when I, when I'm sharp, he's sharp. And yeah. then we and we sharpen each other. And so you have to find, and now hear this, you have to find, you have to find the space to make your partner so vulnerable that they will show you their deepest scars. Now there's a responsibility that comes with that. Because under because knowing those deeper scars makes them so vulnerable because you could use it to weaponize them. But a woman a real woman will use it to help heal him or her. Let's talk about this idea of vulnerability in men. It comes up a lot. And my relationship with my husband, Drake, who you know, uh, there are some people who say masculinity is under attack and it's because of the idea that men should be vulnerable. Um, What are your thoughts? Do I, okay. Tell me your question directly. Do I think men should be vulnerable? Some would say, you know, B, how can you genuinely love somebody that you don't know all of? Do you ever know all of yourself? Therefore, how can you know all of anybody? Well, then that's the work because you got to, you have to. I, 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 I do not want to leave this world, A, not knowing all of who I am because then I will feel like, and it, you know, this is a, a, a spiritual part is like, but I would absolutely feel like I did God a disjustice. You gave me this beautiful life. You made me this beautiful person. You gave me this beautiful experience to be inside this body. And I couldn't even take the time to figure out what that gift actually was. No. Yeah. And so I'm for you, sec- the the path to really understanding yourself and your partner is through and, and let's let's talk about what vulnerability means too, because I think Brene Brown tells us that's a thing that we see all the time. Drake and I watch a lot of uh reality TV show about relationships. We love it. Okay. Okay. We okay, really okay. love it. 
We hear this all the time. I gotta be vulnerable. I gotta be vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable. vulnerable. He's not being vulnerable. It's like a buzzword that's like losing its sense of meaning. But it, as a mother of two girls, as a, a woman with the love of her life, yep. as a producer, yep, right? And then even just as an individual living yep. in this society, yep. tell us what it means to you. It means to be naked in your spirit. It means when you... <laughs> Hold on. Say it again. <laughs> no, no. It means to absolutely be butt naked in your spirit. What does mm. it mean to be vulnerable? means you have to be able to walk around your partner with nothing on. Wow. No filters, no lies, no making it all pretty. No, it means to be naked in your spirit. And let me tell you something. It's freeing. It's absolutely freeing. There is nothing about me that he doesn't know in terms of my fear, in terms of my disgust, in terms of there's nothing about me. And, that he- and, it, and if you discover it, then I'm assuming you're now sharing with absolutely. him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because it, it gives you this space of you're, you're not in this by yourself. And it also gives you a space for, and guess what? It changes too, Kara. It Mm -hmm. changes too. And as it changes, we can talk about that too. It's like, right. And and sometimes I'm crazy because like, girl, no, you just said yesterday. Right. But we talked about that. And I was like, you have to, you know, we had a conversation about that because he's like, you know, babe, I don't know how to respond when I've prepared for what you told me. And then now you have changed that completely. Like, I don't know how to like <laughs> handle that. Right. That's right. A, it's a, and it's, and in his defense, that's a fair statement. I reflect that in my own relationship. The, can I tell you the metaphor that I gave Drake? I said, the- cause he's so creative, right? So his <laughs> mind thinks non-linearly and I think very linearly. So I'm trying to think of a metaphor to help him really get what the essence of a of being a woman is for me. Yeah. That was like, you got to think of us like the tides in the ocean. There is a general way that the ocean is going to move, but it could change. It and change. it ebbs and it flows and the storms come up and the storms come down. You have to understand that my my experience of life is going to be shifting like that. And if you stay prepared for that, then you maybe won't be so shocked. Yeah, absolutely. And you just have to go with it because, and we talked about this, the moment that you create what I call a muzzle on my emotions, Mm. now have, without even trying, you have shown my spirit that we are not, free we can't be that free in you and And, and i think i think a lot of people live here you Mm -hmm. know i'm thinking about um yeah i'm thinking about our listeners right i think about where i've been in my own path where i am in my own journey as a newlywed and trust is something very difficult for us to understand as humans and personally the only way i understand trust is first and foremost with my relationship with god yeah and I, I, and I know that when I'm not trusting God, I'm not trusting my partner for sure. <laughs> and when I'm not trusting my partner and I'm not trusting God, then I'm trusting in my own knowledge. I'm resting on my own understanding of the world. That place, well, you got something to say? I will let you finish. I got to tell you, Adele. That, that place where I'm not trusting my partner and I'm not trusting God, for me, only gets resolved by looking for a God and to understand what is unresolved in my relationship with him. And then I'm restored in my trust to my partner to have that vulnerable conversation. Not from a place of defense. In those moments, Kara, we, Pete, all of it, because I get there too. I, 100%. Yes, sister, we are the same. But you have to ask yourself in that moment, what am I not trust? What is it about me that I'm not trusting in myself? There's something in me that I don't trust in myself in this moment. Because yep. 
because that is the, because we're attract like we're also you know energy so we attract right and so whatever that mistrust is it's it's in you first and so you're not trusting yourself about something and that usually is because you're not being honest with yourself about something and that's usually because you need to have you're not being vulnerable with yourself about something because you are protecting yourself based on some trauma that has happened about something right because that is the mechanism mechanism of like distrust of the mechanism of not being vulnerable is all just a protection of ourselves. It's the, it's protecting ourselves from something that has happened or that we're afraid is going to happen again. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. And I'll say, okay. So my background in personal development, right. Being a massive practitioner of NLP starting as a life coach, also being an actor, you learn self a lot. You learn to understand self and what's happening. And so I appreciate you bringing that up because that's a step that I, that I bypass in my explanation. And I think it's worthy to talk about. And sometimes we forget our own journey. We forget the things that are important to us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I will also say, and this is something I've been posting about on my social media lately. You can't do it without God. Mm-mm. The personal growth element, that self-awareness element that you're talking about, it's literally critical to the success of your anything, relationships, career, if you have health goals, spiritual goals, all of that, you absolutely have to know self. But I recently discovered, and I want to know your uh, take on this, uh, I recently discovered personal growth without God, it's like jumping off of a cliff and thinking that you're flying until you hit rock bottom. You can't just fix the human and think I'm going to have ultimate control over the next phase of my reality. I'll have no more pain. I'll have endless abundance. If you're not really having the reverence to look towards the creator that breathes you, that puts you here, that takes you away, that, in my opinion, breeds a sense of self-importance and a sense of like control that actually doesn't belong to us. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know how they say like, whether you are doing it intentionally or not intentionally, you're always manifesting. Mm-hmm. Whether you're doing it intentionally or not intentionally, you're always serving. So you need to choose who you're serving. And if you are serving if you are making yourself God and you're saying that like that's who you are serving, mm. um, well, God talks about making yourself an idol, right? And so whatever that is for you, whatever that God is, wherever that spiritual, you know, guidance lives in you, it absolutely has to be identified because, and it has to be served because if not, then you're still serving someone. Right. And so when you look at our industry and you look at, you know, those kinds of beliefs and and people feeling like they're like, you know, serving themselves and blah, 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 blah. And you see how demonic and how, you know, sacrificial of, sacrificial of like anything, right? Like, it, you know, it could be your child or whatever. And it's like, you get the mm. $50 million deal. And like, y'all better be listening to what these people are saying because that stuff is true. It's, no way. Um, yeah, I, I just find God first. Um, find God first and allow his guidance to move you in a way where when you get on the other side, you are not disgusted with who you had become to get there. Mm. Because no, that's it is a trade off. There is absolutely a trade off if you do it without God. Let's talk about it with your journey. So, um, um, recently you've been given a great honor. <laughs> oh yeah. You won an Emmy. Congratulations. I did. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Tell us, uh, tell us what you won the Emmy for. Um, so I actually, this is the first trophy. I actually have several like Emmy plaques, um, because I, do, I had done a few different shows um that you know won emmys or or won awards so i I was staying corrected so multiple (laughs) emmy award-winning producer 
And I didn't get it off of any of the shows or the concepts that I did that lived in that negative, you know, unserving space, you know? Um, I really made a uh, bond or an agreement with God that he was going to lead me. Mm. And I am his disciple and that this is my ministry. Um, my career in this way is my ministry and that wow. we together would make something that he was proud of because wow. we have to understand that um, our bodies are going to perish, right? Um, but my soul got to go with him. And so I'm not willing to sacrifice that for anything or anybody, okay? Um, wow. So, may, so in that agreement, right, um, I had been afforded the most incredible opportunity to work on the show Queer Eye and tell these stories and do this work um, that really, I feel, transcended people from a place that they never thought that they could not be in. Um, and that and it helped them to see the light. Um, and and listen, we're there for, you know, two weeks, right, to actually film the show. But we're preparing with these people for months. And it's con it's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of calling. It's a lot of, I'm still friends with like some of the people um, or they call me and we talk. And like, I've been like in the back of the building praying with people before going into like big situations. Um, so it truly is my ministry. I do honestly, absolutely believe that. Um, like I said, I went to school thinking I was going to be a teacher and here I am. So I know that this is ordained by God. Um, and so, so in, in all of, all of that I do. It's amazing. Uh, and I want to give you a moment to be clear about what you have accomplished. Uh, this is a hard thing I've learned for a lot of high performing women who I talk to, to actually do is to actually speak on the accomplishments, uh, I don't know if you've seen the Barbie movie. Not yet. I've you heard so it. much about it. In LA, that's all they were talking about. Yeah, it was a thing. Uh, yeah. But in the Barbie movie, they are all talking about their accomplishments in ways that are, it's funny because we don't often get a chance to do that. And so if you would like the invitation, I would love to invite you to tell us what you have accomplished in your career Without disclaimer, without justification. Oh my God, Kara, I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> right? And none of us do, honestly. I don't even think I know what, like, I think I need to watch the Barbie movie before I can do that. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. So my, um, my husband, whenever we meet people, I am very shy and I'm very private, even though I'm an extrovert, but barely. I'm very shy and I'm very private. And so when we meet new people, I don't like to tell people what I do. I don't like to tell them anything. Cool. And so Drake will often introduce me. This is my wife, Kara. She's an <laughs> entrepreneur. She's a coach. And she was in, baby, what's the name of the show you were in with Barry <laughs> Jenkins? And the, the Moonlight guy, he won an Oscar. Anyway, yeah, Underground Road. She was in that. And I'm always so embarrassed, yeah. partially yeah. because I'm like, that's a weird introduction to give people. Like I, was <laughs> other, I was in other stuff too. So like a part of me that wants a proper introduction because I don't want to say it. Yeah. Like I feel so uncomfortable. And then you go to like the industry of uh, film and television. Generally, there's a whole, again, talking about that pendulum, there's a whole side of the pendulum where people, all they do is name drop. All they That's do it. is talk yep. about yep. who they've worked with and what. Da, 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 da. And That's, so we don't want to yeah. be identified with that. But the yep. reality is, I can see behind you next to an orchid, <laughs> a trophy, and it's an, an Emmy that you earned. Yeah. And so I'll give you an invitation one more time. If you would yeah. like the opportunity yeah. to just tell the world what you have accomplished without disclaimer and without shame, <laughs> I invite you to do so. All right, first of all, I have to tell you something. So when I was producing, very much like you, did not I used to tell people I work at Walmart, girl. I, I had like I had like maybe 10, 12 shows under my belt doing it like, girl, work at Walmart. My friends would be like, Well, why are you doing uh, that? It's just easier. Nobody asks you anything. 
They don't that's, say, like, do you work in the, do, do, are you a manager? Do you work at the door? Do you work? No, at the, that's so true. That, it's like when Walmart. you're on set for commercials, when people come by, they, and like, what are you filming? What are you filming? Yeah. You say, oh, it's a mayonnaise commercial because then nobody cares. cares. <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay. So you oh. don't work at Walmart, but my lady, the stage is yours. Yes. Yes. So. Um, again, I am a producer, uh, some would say extraordinaire. That's a disclaimer. I got you. Um, and Scratch. Scratch. all right, take um, two, take two. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. And action. <laughs> I am an executive producer. Um, and I have created shows from housewives to queer eye to y'all have fixed my life. I have created shows. I've produced shows. And most recently I have received the greatest honor of winning an Emmy, um, which is just so phenomenal. So, 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 so big. And really, 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 honestly, the truest testament to God, um, like 100%. This is a God's prayer. And, he has, I mean, just, I mean, can you believe it? Like he, he did it. And I'm just so grateful for it. Um, I'm really skilled in telling authentic stories and telling them well. And, um, so it's finally paid off. So I'm excited. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank and you. So whoa, your look, by the way, I just, um, you looked fantastic. You looked um, like a queen. You. Thank you. Thank you. It was a big deal. I mean, it was a really big deal. And honestly, like when I got there, it wasn't like now I recognize that like next year, cause I'm, I'm going to go again and win another one next year. But when I go next year, um, I'm not going to be like that dramatic. So it was like the first year kill it. Um, but you know, it was, it was just a dream. My God, it was just really a dream the whole day, the whole experience, just like being honored at that level for doing something that you love and enjoy. And again, I truly, truly, genuinely in my soul know that this is my ministry. So to be honored, um, for my ministry is just, you know, I have no words. I have no words, but I am just really grateful for God's like favor on my life. That's beautiful. And um, I love that you call it your ministry. And I love that you receive a recognition for what you do. I think a lot of, especially creatives who are watching this, do you consider yourself a creative? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. 100%. But in, in, in creative, um, is also an experience with God. Like anybody who is actually creative can tell you that when you are in it, it is sometimes you come out of it and like, oh, wait, what did I just do? Like, yeah, because you are, it is such a vertical experience. And when I say vertical, I mean like up, down, me and God. Um, it's such a vertical experience that you can't even see horizontally. Like, I don't even know what you guys are doing. Um, so absolutely, I'm a creative because my, uh, what I offer is very spiritual. Absolutely. And I can see that now knowing the shows you've been on, I didn't know you when I was watching them, but now I can totally see that through line, that spirit, that, you know, that universal part that makes us feel connected. Uh, but winning an Emmy, a universally recognized award that some people put on their vision board, some people go to great lengths to try and win this Receiving this honor, receiving this reward for what you call your ministry, that has to be a little unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it just happened. So I keep saying that, like, it hasn't marinated in my spirit yet, to be honest, to be very mm -hmm. honest, because it's just that big. Um, that I'm still, like, watching the videos. I'm still going through the pictures. I'm still reliving um, I'm still asking my partner, Chaz, like, what was this like? What was that? Like, what was this thing? What was that thing? Um, and do you remember this? Um, how do you feel like, and yeah. I know it's still moving in your spirit, but how do you feel like this has changed your idea of what you want to do in your career moving forward? Oh, oh, now that, that was immediate. Um, 
The first thing is that even as spiritual as we become and even as much as we like have these conversations about like what we, you know, want from God and and how, you know, we move and da da da. It's a whole nother thing to actually see. It's kind of the same thing as like me being from Delaware and then coming to Atlanta and my great right. but then seeing it. So to see God in that way, I had to repent because as much as I knew who that he could and I knew that it could happen, um, there was still a part of me that wasn't a hundred percent soul. Mm. And so I had to repent that like, God, I played you way too small. Wow. This little black girl from Slutter Neck, Delaware is being approached by Kenya Burris. D- For those who don't know who Kenya Burris is, uh, he created Blackish. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Black AF. And, he's looking and a at bunch me of like, other who stuff. Who am I? To the point that for a second, Kara, for a second, I was like, do we, do I know him? Like, what? Did I work with him before or something? And Chad was like, no. <laughs> yes. he's, a, he's a big deal, especially in... A huge deal. Not just in the industry, but I think culturally, too, because he cares yeah. so much about Black people. Um, fun fact, one of my first um, life coaching clients was uh, worked for him for a while. Oh. Um, okay. And then she ended up launching off and creating phenomenal projects, um, one of which went to Sundance. And so um, Kenya is, I think, represents, for me at least, as a viewer of this type of programming and also as an actor, Kenya for me represents like the guy that did the thing that we all talked about wanting to do with our friends, but like we didn't do it. He did it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then even just like blackish, me and Chaz together, like you know how you and Jake watch like the relationship shows. That's us. Like we yeah. know every episode. We watch every Same. episode. It's so relatable. So good. I miss it. Bring it back. Bring, Bring it, back. it. I was so sad when Are it girl, and Drake. Let's not even talk about that. Let's not even talk about when it. Oh, left. I love it so but much. I love it so Same. much. And so for I mean, Ricky Minor was carrying my dress. Okay, <laughs> like it was phenomenal and i was just like god how did i play so small so like you know the number one thing is as the kids say i recognize i was like oh god you're the big guy not the little one you know Uh, (laughs) that's the the first first and foremost thing and so playing big right um playing so big um and then as you said as women especially women of color like we don't always live in our own power we don't always recognize like, you know, who and whose we are for real, right? Mm. Um, and so um my own self, like, okay, what do we actually want to do? Because we're gonna right. like right. let's not play small, let's not make excuses, Ooh. let's have the disclaimers. Like, what is it that we actually want to do? Come on, we're gonna go do that. So it's um, it's it's real it's, it's, I want to pause there for a moment because it's really a fascinating sort of juncture that you're sitting at. Because I think a lot of people would look at you and say, Okay, you mentioned earlier you've won Emmys as a part of shows. You've won Emmys while working on other shows. You've got many Emmy plaques. This is your first award. And you've been in this industry for almost two decades. You've got two children. You've got a loving partner, a great relationship. You understand who you are as a a person in God. You're beautiful. You're still young. I mean, what more is there? And yet you're sitting here having won this award saying, oh, I've been playing it small in my life. That's right. That's right. So girlfriend, girlfriend, if you're making $2 million or $20, you're playing it small because God is mm-hmm. bigger than that. You don't want to know why? Because there's a level of freedom. There's a level of legacy. There's a le- level of waking up and truly j- enjoying the space that you're at for yourself, right? Mm, there's mm. that, there's that. And that to me is the ultimate goal for me, right? Like right. I want to be able to wake up and take my kids wherever I want to go because I want to do it. And and I know that that's possible and that's what's happening this year. I want to do my own, uh, I want to use my own creative ministry 
for my own self, right? Like mm. I don't want it to be on the demand of somebody else. I don't want it to be waiting for a call for the next show. That's not what Oof. I'm looking to do, right? Because Huge. then, because then I can truly operate in the kingdom of God. I can truly operate in his mm. truly operate without the reins and the strains of all the other things that are involved. Because at the end of the day, yes, it is my ministry, but it is still also very much a job. And right. I do also very much have to prepare the meal that is for a recipe that is given to me. I have, I do figure out what seasonings that come from God to make it, you know, my own sauce. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I am a client. I'm sorry. At the end of the day, I have a client. You know what I mean? And, and so I have to um, I have to give my client what they're asking for. But if I can do it on my own reins, then I can truly just be the client of God. And that's what I really, really want. I love that. You just said the client of God. <laughs> yes. Interesting. I want that so bad. So <clears throat> I want to know what is it that's tugging at your heart? What's oh, next? I, without a doubt. Um, I am working right now on a show and it's called Cooking Trap. Um, it's already in the works. Um, it has been in the works for the past five years. Uh, but just now are we like foot on the gas, making it go. Um, I have dreamt. I, I know that it is necessary, um, not just for myself, but for my community and for my women and for my men and for relationships. Um, <laughs> And it is a show that we make good food. Okay. So anybody who knows me. Okay. You know, I, I just need, I need to pause. Wait a minute. Okay. So I just, can I get an invitation to the food part of it? Oh can my I get... gosh. So we have two people, Kara. Yes. Come on. <laughs> yes. Two people. <laughs> They're going to sit at the bar and we're going to have some good conversation and you're going to eat some good food and drink a little bit of good wine. And, uh, and, and, and it'll be, um, a space of openness and dialogue that is not always going to make us feel warm and fuzzy, but it's going to make us feel related. And so I want to talk about the things that, uh, we're scared to say out loud. And I want to help us heal some of that, but I want to learn and I want to teach and I want to grow and I want to share these authentic dishes. And, um, because, you know, we, t I, I talk about this a lot is that like, again, humanity, right? If you think about humanity, the two things that are proof that no matter who you are or where you are, you will be connected to another human with, and that's food and music. Mm. music no matter where you are a sad song sounds like a sad song mm. no matter where you are a happy song sounds like a happy song mm. no matter where you are good food feels good right and even yeah. though we have different tastes and we you know things taste good to me that don't taste good to you but it's this it's the sensation it's of it it's, it's the sensation it's, it's the satisfying good. feeling and it's also the auditory experience right so you're, yeah, and you're touching connected. on when you think anywhere in the world, um, a celebration, a grief um, is always surrounded by food because there's a, there because food feeds our energy. Right. Yeah. So I want to feed our souls and connectivity um, through this show concept. It is going to be an absolute great time. You're going to cry. You're going to laugh. You're going to learn. And together we're going to grow. Um, it's called Cooking Trap. Um, because we are going to trap our feelings inside this food child and we're going to grow from it and it's going to be quite the experience. And so that's what um, that's what we're on to next. That's amazing. And if you're lucky uh, to know Corey King, you might get to taste this food even before the show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's second secrets in the works for you, doll. There's some secrets getting... in the works for you. All right. I know this is about you, but God, I need to taste this food, girl. Yeah. Anybody who knows me, I mean, they literally come to my house just to eat. And, um, I hate I cooking. I hate it so much. I know you do, girl. I know you do. But I'm going to... I, we'll see. I want to change that for you. <laughs> I want to make something, there's something that you that, enjoy making. Yeah, there's some there's something there. There's something there for sure. Um it's because you know you you gotta turn your music on, you gotta got you have no, 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 
that's not it. You know, I'm gonna tell you in a word what, is it? what, what it is. is. My mom, two words. My mom. What? Tell me more. Complicated relationship. Uh, she is the one in the family who cooks and feeds people. And that's her joy. That's her gift. That's her ministry. Oh. And uh, I didn't I didn't come out knowing how to do those things. I'm a creative person, but I have my own creative process. I learned from a course. I learned from instructions. I learned from reading a book. Uh, but I had all this expectation on me that I should be good at cooking. And when I wasn't, I got it from the person I was dating. I got it from my sister. I got it from my mom. I got, from, I got it all this from my... And so I never took the time to move past it. To, uh, and I know this. Uh, I just never took the time to find there. the joy in doing it. And so now when I cook for my family, I rest on cooking and preparing nutritious, yes, healthy, whole foods. I lean there first. And then flavor and, and variety and, and the creativity, all of that. That I ain't got time for that. Oh, we're going to take your power back. That's okay. Okay. I look forward to that. <laughs> we'll take your power back. <clears throat> and so we'll drink. So you are a mother of two. <laughs> Soon to be three. Soon to be three. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Girl. It's happening. And the, what are the ages of your children? So I have two daughters, uh, four and 16 months, and then I'm going to have a son in uh, July. Is this the gender reveal? <laughs> I actually had the gender reveal at the Emmys, and it was so, so amazing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So you have, woo. All right. You've got your children. You've got two and one on the way. And then I have two children um, from Chaz's previous marriage who are 14 and 12. Whoa. Yeah. Do you feel a sense of um, a connection with them? Like you're a bonus mom or a stepmom or what's your relationship? Um, well, we have the, so I've been in their life since they were uh, seven and five. I think wow. seven and five. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, they obviously like they, they live and have their mom. Um, and you know, she's always, but they're mixed, right? So they're white, their mom is white and Chaz is black. And then I'm obviously black. And so they, I feel like, um, our connection has absolutely, like I had to teach her how to do her hair and like, you know, just like things like that, that yes. she was able to connect with. Um, with me and that her mom was open enough to allow us to have that kind wow. of relationship, um, which has just been truly a blessing. Um, so they are absolutely my kids. If when we, <laughs> I have to tell you a funny story. One time it was just me and them and uh, we went out to eat and this guy came up to us and he's like, oh my gosh, your family is so beautiful and da 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 da. And like, um, your kids are so beautiful. And I started to like, try to like explain it. Cause it would always be weird. Right. Like, I don't know. I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I don't want to feel like I was lying. Um, and I went to say something and before I could get it out, my son was like, she's our mom. Like, just like, we're not going to like, wow. All that. He's like, you're just our mom. Like you don't have to like make a deal. So it's always been that way. Um, wow. they, you know, very early on were obviously hesitant. Like they, you know, their parents weren't together and like they had to figure that out. But they made it very clear for me that, like, we are a family. You are a mom. And, you know, we handle them that way. I mean, they are, you know, 100% my family's family as well. Like, yeah. mom says she has 17 grandkids. They're included in that. That's beautiful. We have Christmas so, and we go to my mom's house. Their name is on the stock end. So, yeah. Mm. Very so this, I'm glad that you clarified because it adds a even new layer of complexity to your identity and your circumstances as a mother. Yeah. So you've got two children from your womb. You've got two children that are not from your womb that you still claim to be like yours. Uh, and you've got one in the womb. Oh, so soon to be mother of five, if you will. Yes, absolutely. Party of seven. <laughs> right this way. You're going you're gonna to have to get a sprinter van. <clears throat> I know we keep talking about it. We literally are getting a new car because we have too many kids now. <laughs> yeah. It's cute. 
to talk about our children. Your children are absolutely adorable. Hey. Um, and it's cute as a mom to have that mom connection and talk about, you know, all the things. And But there's another side to being a mom as a high-performing woman. How has that been for you? Um, yes, challenging. But I am so blessed to have my partner. Um, and we are so blessed to have our family. Um, but there are parts that your partner and your family can't fix, like the mommy guilt, you know, Oof. like Oof. sometimes I have to go for two weeks. I have to. Um, and that's really, really hard. And no matter how much they like, it's fine. We got them. You're good. Da, 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 FaceTime, whatever. Sometimes I'm in a different time zone. So I don't talk to them for two days. You know, at one point I was in Africa. Oof. And how, and, and when you're there, you mentioned mom guilt. But what is that experience like for you internally? Is there a conflict between what you're doing? It's your ministry. It's your career. It's important. And that part of you that wants nothing more than to just be with them. What's that experience of that conflict like? Um, you, for me and for any other woman who... Um, is like me and has this experience, I think the most important thing is to commit to balance, right? Um, you have to commit to, I cannot do it for longer than this thing. And you have to make sure that whatever mm -hmm. that thing is good in your spirit and then communicate that with their family. Well, so, first, you're saying, so you're saying I, I can be away from my children for a certain amount of time or I can be away from my children for this, this specific type of project or work or outcome that is, it, it earns. A, but there has to focus. be a boundary. Like mm -hmm. everything else, there has to be a boundary. So sometimes you're going to have to say no, but it is important to be able to say no for your family. You have you ever, have to, you ever had to say no? Many times, many wow. times. I've had to leave thousands of dollars on the table for my family. Um, but knowing, you know, we, we don't live in a space of scarcity, right? Like we got to, we serve a big God. We talked about that. And so it's okay to leave something on the table because not, and nothing that is for you is going to pass you. So that thing just is not for you for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, sometimes you got to leave it on the table. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, you are pregnant. You are, comp you are with child in this moment. Absolutely. It's a, being pregnant is a whole experience. And it changes your mind. It changes your body, changes your emotions, right? hormones. It changes a lot about you. It's your third time doing it. So you're more prepared probably for what to expect, which is well, expect not, the unexpected. The only thing is this is a boy and he, and I knew that he was a boy before the uh, reveal because my pregnancy is just so different Yeah, than both of my other ones. It's so much more um, taxing on my body mm. and like, I puke every day and like, Oof. and like four or five times a day. And I can't, Whoa. I don't, yeah, it's intense. And so I knew it was a boy because it is quite the challenge. Interesting. Um, and neither, and my girls were challenging in a different way. They were. Yeah. Cause it's, it's also your first time being pregnant. Right. And then it's yeah. your second time after the first time. Yeah. But this is like, <laughs> I, I can't eat ever. Yeah. That's, you know, um, but that's, not, that's, that's not that's not good. Um, I, well, I'm what I'm <laughs> curious to to talk about and share how your career is going. Your career has been going before you had kids. You had kids. You're still having kids, and yep. your career is going. Yep. How? What? I mean, how has that been navigating the insanity of being pregnant and being on set, or like having babies when you're traveling? What has it been like? Lots and lots and lots and lots of prayer. I cannot, I guess I'm not on the other side yet. And um, I always say you should heal from a place of scars, not wounds. Mm -hmm. you, I, I'm not on the other side yet. I can just tell you that while I'm in it, um, I just, ha I just stay focused on God because I realize that one day these kids are going to be grown up 
and they're going to need to move on and they're going to have their own careers and they're going to have their own lives. And I want them to see an example of what it means to do it anyway. Be mm, happy. Wow. Live your dreams anyway. Wow. There's no excuse not to be the best version of yourself. Do it anyway, right? You're pregnant, you're throwing up, do it anyway. You're, you know, you have a family, you have to take care of them, but you're scared, do it anyway. You like do it anyway. I, and, and I don't want my kids to ever use anything. If I could have three of y'all, five of y'all and still figure this out, you have no excuse. And you saw it firsthand. Exposure is everything. We talked about that, right? And so I want to be an example for my kids to beyond everything, do it anyway, beyond your fears, beyond your sickness, beyond your shortcomings, beyond your everything, do it anyway, you know? And- And what would you say to the person watching that's saying, well, not everybody has to do everything. You should, if you're sick or you're not doing well, you should think about your health. You should think about, what would you say to that person? I would say, do what serves you. Mm. If I don't want to, if at the, at the, you know, you know, they always say like, live your life as if it's the last day. If you get to the end, and imagine this and meditate and pray on this. Like if you get to the end and you look back and say, I wish I would have did mm-hmm. that anyway, do mm-hmm. it today anyway. Right. If you, if you, at the same time, if you say, I shouldn't have did that, I should have took a break there because I was really breaking down and I knew that my body was done. And I, and now that I did it anyway, now I'm broken. Obviously don't do that, but do what serves you. And when you look back at the end, make sure that you have created a life that God is proud of you and you are proud of yourself. And whatever that takes, you have to look at that every day, every piece, every every opportunity, every minute, moment by moment. It is hard to be a mom. It is hard to be a mom alone because every day I'm worried about how am I, what am I creating in them that is not serving them or that won't serve them? Or what are the traumas that I'm passing on to them that Mm. they don't serve or that I don't even know about, right? And so it's taking the time to really, really reflect and say, God, what would you have me to do? Who would you have me to be? And what the Bible says that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. And so whatever those things are that you are doing in Christ, do it anyway. Wow. That's pretty. amen. That works for me. That's what works for me. I, no, I, love I can't it. tell you how to do it. You, I'll just tell you how it works for me. No, it's good. It's good because it's anchoring to the destination. We're all going to arrive at. And some of us won't get the opportunity to reflect before we go, but all of us will die. And, and you will, and you don't just die when you die. There is a report card that is turned in. There's a report card that is turned in. And you have to make sure that you understand that. And in understanding that, you have to, God, I want to hear the Lord say, well done. Yes. My good and faithful servant. Yes. My good and faithful servant. I have to be faithful to him. And so sometimes I'm going to be sick. Sometimes I'm going to be sad. Sometimes it's it's going to, you know, be hurtful. I'm going to be tired. I ain't going to feel like it. Just as simple as that sometimes. But am I good and am I faithful? Because mm. he's been that to me. He's wow. always that to me. And so I owe it to his kingdom. And I owe it to my service to show up for God whenever I can. And when I can't, He knows that. And I pray about that too. But for what I have, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in my eyes. And I continue to live in that way. And I want my kids to see that firsthand. I just love you. I mean, I love everything that you're saying. I, I share a lot of the same sentiments and passion that you do about this. And so I'm so happy to hear you say it, girl, preach. (laughs) Stop it. It's so important. It's real. It's so important. And it's important that we as women rally around each other in a way that feels positive and uplifting and for because as much as as cute as this is, I just came off an Emmy. Okay. So yes, I feel wonderful. 
But it is days that I don't feel this good. And I need my friend to talk, to speak life into me sometimes. You know, so it's important for us to like minded women continue to bond and push each other and support each other. And when we are not showing up, hold each other accountable. That's right. You know, and 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 I feel like we could do another episode and talk specifically about the relationships between women and how complicated they are, especially among high achieving women. Absolutely. Um, Something that I really like about you is I met you before I knew what you did and who you were. And as we talked about, I don't like to share a lot about what I do. And so we met each other on a mutual playing ground and just happened to uncover, oh, we have some some similar interests. Yeah, absolutely. And I do that on purpose too, Kara. Like working at Walmart was that same thing is because, especially in our industry, in Atlanta is baby Hollywood, right? And so people (laughs) will start to... um, I just had to be careful about protecting my spirit. Yeah. And so it was, it's always important for me to meet the person. Yep. Or I know who or what they are. Cause that part isn't important to me. Yeah. Right. Like, I love, you know, that you have wonderful things happening in your life. And I love that you are following your dreams, but truly I don't really care. That's not I'm, the thing that defines it, you. Right. Who I want to know your spirit. spirit. What's right? your character? What's your character? What What's drives you? What drives you? What doesn't drive you? Mm. What what attracts you? What repels you? Because again, you got to remember that it's important to you know that the, and this is this is an honest to God thing. They say, show me your net worth. Work. Uh, show me your net worth. I'll show you your net worth. Right. It's important to know who <laughs> and what you're being associated with. Um, yeah. And so that's why it's like, oh, I'm just Corey. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah. But and the reality is that is really the truth at the end of it all, right? We're going to yeah. be stripped of all of the titles, of all of the things, of all of the beauty. You know, you're not going to be able to take that beautiful trophy with you. It's going to stay on earth while you ascend. Uh, and I appreciate that about you. And and also, can I just say thank you? Thank you. Thank you for this very grounded, honest, authentic conversation about you. And what you do and yeah. your journey. Yeah. But it's about us too, right? Remember that like, I am not my sister's keeper. I am my sister. So this journey is about us, right? Like if you see, or if you find any part of what I'm experiencing in your journey, use that as an influence and motivation is that like, I might just be in the middle, you know? Yeah. Um, and and that is literally the whole point of the show, right? How yeah. does she do it is all about somebody looking at Corey King and saying, wow, how does she do it? Because I want to see myself in her. I see myself in her. There is a sense of community that comes from us sharing the true authentic stories, the challenges and the triumphs that we experience. Yeah. Right. There's a sense of community and there's also inspiration that comes from that. Just hearing Motherhood is hard. I'll tell you quickly, when Obama, when Michelle Obama was being interviewed by uh, Oprah for her book tour, it was on Netflix, she said something that I will never forget about her relationship with uh, President Barack Obama. She said, relationships are hard. And I didn't really like my husband for about 10 years. Yes. When our children were small. Mm-hmm. And that gave me such a sense of comfort in knowing the chaotic nature of having, I have right now two children under under two and we've been married for two years, that this is just a season. And if I can get that inspiration from two people that are on my television screen, right? Yeah. I, mean, I know that people are going to be inspired by what you have shared here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can talk about that too, girl. That is, that could be it's a whole other thing because absolutely. And then, you know, let's not even throw in the idea, like for my personal experience, like, you know, you got two kids, y'all both trying to like, you know, chase your careers and, you know, one might be going faster than the other. And so there's discouragement, but there's also a little bit of like what feels like resentment, even though you know that that's your partner, that's your person. 
And so you got the financial whatevers based on the, on top of the time, on top of the kids, on top of the this, that, and the other. And it's like, how do you navigate that? Exactly. That is a lot about self. You will, if you can, and that, and I would love for us to figure out a, a time that we could do that because there's so many jewels that I would love to give women, which that lives in, um, if you can understand it and if you can master it, um, you will grow and find your best self because even in those moments, there are opportunities to uncover (laughs) traumas inside of yourself that you will be able to heal and become better about. I'm telling you. Um, I believe you. And we should absolutely have a conversation about that dynamic uh, to be continued. To be continued. (laughs) Wonderful. I have to say thank you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that you're doing this. Your hair is flawless. And (laughs) and I'm so happy that you allowed me on for this platform. Uh, But I'm so proud of you. And I know that this is going to help so many women. So thank you for doing a service to our community. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Truly. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up for anyone that wants to find you, how can they find you and connect with you? Absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram at King Corey TV. It's K I N G G two G's Corey K O R I TV, um, on Instagram. And that's really where I'm living at right now. We'll have cooking trap emails up and you'll be able to like follow me and see all the links there, but, um, find me there now. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor. And I look forward to part two, girl. Yes, me too. Thank you so much. I definitely appreciate you. Thank you for joining us on another empowering episode of How Does She Do It? The podcast that brings you real challenges and real wisdom from high achieving women who've blazed their own trails. If you've enjoyed today's episode and want more inspiration like this, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on your podcast platform. By subscribing, you'll never miss an episode and you'll be part of our growing community. We'd also love to hear from you. Please take a moment to leave us a review and share your thoughts about the show. Your reviews help us reach more listeners and continue to spotlight incredible women and their journeys. Sharing is caring. So if you found today's episode valuable, please share it with your friends, your family, your colleagues, and together we can spread the success stories of these resilient women far and wide. And if you are a high achieving woman, who resonates with our mission and would like to explore sharing your own journey on our show, we invite you to reach out, connect with us on our website at caraflowers.com backslash podcast or through social media. I personally value connections and I would be delighted to hear from you. Thank you for being a part of our community, your support, your stories, and your determination inspire us every day. Until next time, keep achieving, keep thriving and keep asking, how does she do it?